The understanding of art depends finally upon one's willingness to extend one's humanity and one's knowledge of human life. These are the words of Ralph Waldo Ellison. His name may sound very similar to another well-known American figure, Ralph Waldo Emerson. That's because Ralph Ellison was named after the great poet. Ralph Waldo Ellison, not Emerson, a black American, was born on March 1st, 1913. Or 1914. Many reliable embedded sources conflict in those years, and I wasn't able to ascertain why, but an NPR source acknowledged the contradiction and stated that 1913 is the correct year, but didn't give a reason why that's the case. Anyway, Ellison was an American writer, literary critic, and scholar, best known for his novel Invisible Man, not the Invisible Man, quite a distinction, an entirely different novel, a work of science fiction, prior, by H.G. Wells. No, Ellison's Invisible Man was published in 1952 and remains an essential American classic, which won the National Book Award in 1953. It was through reading this book that I became interested and enamored by Ralph Ellison and chose to make this next episode of Beautiful Gray Sponge to be about him. So, let's get into it. He was the second of three sons born to Louis Alfred Ellison and Ida Brownie, was her nickname, Millsap, in Oklahoma, where his father had a successful business and the family lived comfortably. His parents' firstborn, Alfred, died in infancy, but then they had Ralph, followed by his younger brother, Herbert Maurice, in 1916. His father's small business as owner and construction foreman involved delivering ice and coal. Outside of work, his father loved literature. As I said, he named Ralph after the famous poet, and he shared this love for reading with his boys. Ralph later discovered, as an adult, that his father had hoped he would grow up to be a poet. But tragically, when young Ellison was only three years old, his father died when a hundred-pound ice block dropped while being loaded into a hopper, penetrating his abdomen. While the impact didn't kill him immediately, he died after a failed operation attempted to remove the shards of ice. After he died, the family struggled financially, and the lifestyle they were accustomed to changed. But just as his father had loved reading, his mother continued encouraging Ralph's reading habit. She'd bring home magazines and books from residences she cleaned. Financially, she supported her young family by working as a nursemaid, a janitor, and as a domestic. She remarried three times, but I doubt any of them measured up to the man her Lewis was. For a time, in 1921, she and the boys moved to Gary, Indiana, where she had a brother. According to Ellison, as black Americans, his mother felt that her boys would have a better chance of reaching manhood if they grew up in the North. But when she didn't find a job, and her brother lost his, the family returned to Oklahoma. As a young boy and into his teens, Ralph worked various jobs as a busboy, a shoeshine, a hotel waiter, and even as a dentist's assistant to support the family. Throughout his life, he looked to culture and intellectualism as a source of identity, with a wide range of interests, becoming something of a Renaissance man. From music, both classical and jazz, to sports, theater, photography, and sculpture. From an early age, Ellison loved music. He played his first instrument, a cornet, at age eight. A neighborhood friend's father offered him free lessons by playing trumpet and alto saxophone. Ellison would go on to become the school bandmaster. Also as a child, Ellison showed a lifelong interest in audio technology, starting by taking a part in rebuilding radios, and later, with the ins and outs of electronic devices, he moved on to constructing and customizing elaborate hi-fi stereo systems as an adult. In sports, while attending Douglas High School, he even found time to play on the school's football team. He graduated from high school in 1931. After high school, he worked for a year and found the money to make a down payment on a trumpet, using it to play with local musicians and take further music lessons, including piano. In hopes to study music, Ellison applied twice for admission to Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, the prestigious all-black university founded by Booker T. Washington. He was finally admitted in 1933 
to fill a seat as a trumpet player in the orchestra. Interestingly, Ellison hopped freight trains to get to Alabama, hoboing with his uncle to get to Tuskegee. Once there, at age 19, he enrolled as a music major. Although drawn to jazz, he studied classical music and the symphonic form because he aimed for a career as a composer and performer of classical music. Aside from his music interests, he continued in his love for the literary world as well. In 1934, he began to work as a desk clerk at the university library, where he read voraciously writers like T.S. Eliot, citing the wasteland as a major awakening moment and inspiration, as well as writers James Joyce, Dostoevsky, Gertrude Stein, and Hemingway, another noted favorite. In more than one source, I came across the notion that Ellison was disenchanted with Tuskegee and felt that the institution was no less class conscious than white institutions generally were. He stayed until 1936. After his third year, that summer, he decided to move to New York City, citing financial issues as a reason for his absence. This was during the Great Depression, after all. While supposedly planning to complete his education in due time, he never returned. When he arrived in New York, he found lodging at a YMCA in Harlem, then the cultural capital of black America. There he met Langston Hughes, the man who'd introduced him to the black literary establishment, and writers Richard Wright and Alan Locke, who all mentored him. He started to work as a researcher and writer for the New York Federal Writers Program, and during this period, he began to publish some of his essays and short stories and also worked as managing editor for the Negro Quarterly. So it's the 1930s now, and he's in New York. He's meeting lots of people and likely dating. According to one biographer, Ellison was attracted to beautiful and intellectual women. And based on my research, women moderately older. In his early 20s, he married stage actress Rosa Armenta Poindexter, the year was 1938. During their marriage in 1941, he had an affair with Sonora Babb, an American novelist, poet, literary editor, and a white woman who was several years his senior. I did a little side work to learn more about her and was intrigued. Perhaps a future episode. Anyway, he confessed to his wife about the short-lived affair, and in 1943 the marriage was over. But Ellison would find lasting love after all. In 1946, he married Fanny McConnell. McConnell was an accomplished person herself, a scholarship graduate of the University of Iowa who was a founder of the Negro People's Theater in Chicago and a writer for the Chicago Defender. She was also very influential in his success. She helped support Ellison financially while he wrote Invisible Man. From 1947 to 1951, he earned some money writing book reviews, but most of his time he spent working on Invisible Man. Fanny also helped type Ellison's longhand text and assisted him in editing the typescript as it progressed. Side note, somewhere in between his romances, with the outbreak of World War II in there, Ellison had joined the U.S. Merchant Marine as a cook in the North Atlantic. It was during this time that he began to think of writing a major novel. However, it wasn't until after the war that he began writing what was to become Invisible Man. And it took him five years. While these episodes of Beautiful Gray Sponge highlight the lives of great minds, and not so much the details of their work, it's notable to mention Ellison's greatest known piece of literature. Yes, Invisible Man, published in 1952. Invisible Man explores the theme of a person's search for their identity and place in society seen from the perspective of the first-person narrator, an unnamed African-American man, first in the Deep South and then in the New York City of the 1930s. Ellison explores racism and the alienating effects of implicit and explicit varieties, both in the South and the North. I came across a description of the novel as a bildostroman, Bildostroman, a type of novel that depicts and explores the manner in which the protagonist develops morally, spiritually, or psychologically. The German word Bildostroman means it's a novel of ed education or novel of formation. Invisible Man won the 1953 U.S. National Book Award for Fiction, as I mentioned in the intro. 
The award was his ticket into the American literary establishment. A perfectionist regarding the art of the novel, Ellison had said in accepting his National Book Award for Invisible Man that he felt he had made, quote, an attempt at a major novel, end quote. And despite the award, he was unsatisfied with the book. In one interview, he even remarked, quote, it's not an important novel. I felt of eloquence, and many of the immediate issues are rapidly fading away. If it does last, it will be simply because there are things going on in its depth that are of more permanent interest than on its surface. I hope so, anyway. End quote. From the time Invisible Man first appeared in 1952, it was a popular and critical success on the bestseller list for 16 weeks. And more than 40 years later, Nobel Prize winner Saul Bellow even declared, This book holds its own among the best novels of the century. Writing essays about both the black experience and his love for jazz music, Ellison continued to receive major awards for his work. In 1955, after his success with Invisible Man, he traveled to Europe, visiting and lecturing in Rome as a fellow of the American Academy to speak out for literature as a moral instrument. In 1958, he returned to the United States to teach at a variety of colleges and universities, including Bard College, the University of Chicago, Rutgers, Yale, and New York University. Among his esteemed positions, he also received numerous literary and academic awards, along with two presidential medals from Johnson and Reagan, and a state medal from France. The New York Times dubbed him, quote, among the gods of America's literary Parnassus. In other words, a genius, among the greatest muses of art and literature at the center of creative activity. Despite some social and political controversies during his life and his unpopular opinions, opinions such as his once communist sympathies, later denounced, his view of American culture and African American culture as joined rather than as separate entities, and that he supported the Vietnam War, his novel, nevertheless, and his critical essays remain monumental contributions to American literature. Ellison died on April 16th, 1994 of pancreatic cancer. Placed to rest in a crypt at Trinity Church Cemetery and Mausoleum in the Washington Heights neighborhood of Upper Manhattan. You can find some interesting and specific details with enough research. A monument outside 730 Riverside Drive in Harlem, New York, that's another example of research, Ellison's longtime home, commemorates his life and his work. With him until the end, Fanny later died in 2005 at the age of 93. While I didn't take us into many of his other manuscripts and essays, it's worth mentioning that posthumous writings were assembled from voluminous notes he left behind. The first book had been compressed into 368 pages from nearly 2,000 of the original pages under the scrupulous work of John F. Callahan, a professor who'd become close friends with Ellison and appointed as his literary executor by Fanny. Callahan was overwhelmed, notably so, by the amount of Ellison's notes, computer disks, and manuscript pages. In 1999, Callahan finished editing the most cohesive part of Ellison's unfinished manuscript, which was released as the standalone novel Juneteenth. He then worked on the manuscript for several more years in an effort to publish a longer version. The longer manuscript, with supporting notes, was released in 2010 under the title Three Days Before the Shooting. Interviewed by Alfred Chester and Vilma Howard in the spring issue of the Paris Review in 1955, they had this to say about Ellison. To listen to him is rather like sitting in the back of a huge hall and feeling the lecturer's faraway eyes staring directly into your own. The highly emphatic, almost professional intonations startle with their distance, self-confidence, and warm undertones of humor. End quote. It's an impressive interview, and I was in awe of reading it word for word. You can find it accessible online. To close out, I'd actually like to share a snippet of that 1955 interview with you. The interviewers ask, Would you say that the search for identity is primarily an American theme? Ellison responds, 
It is the American theme. The nature of our society is such that we are prevented from knowing who we are. It is still a young society, and this is an integral part of its development. I feel that, with my decision to devote myself to the novel, I took on one of the responsibilities inherited by those who practiced the craft in the U.S., that of describing for all that fragment of the huge, diverse American experience which I know best and which offers me the possibility of contributing not only to the growth of the literature, but to the shaping of the culture as I should like it to be. The American novel is, in this sense, a conquest of the frontier. As it describes our experience, it creates it. And that was Ellison's response. Remember the quote at the beginning? The willingness to extend one's humanity and one's knowledge of human life. Maybe we can recognize again and again the wholeness of the human experience, too. And that's it. The Life of Ralph Waldo Ellison. Featured here on another episode of Beautiful Gray Sponge. I hope your sense of identity develops and leaves space for growth as you learn and relate more to others and their own remarkable stories. Thank you for taking the time to listen and for your attention. To wrap up with a nice little bow, I'd like to thank Brianne and Karen, two new listeners who recently contributed a donation to my work. Maybe one day this will be my bread and butter, but for now, it's the little bit of salt that adds the most to my life. If you'd like to support my work, research, and production as well, please visit my website at lmtrosel.com. That's L M for May. T-R-O-S-T-L-E dot com to find out how you can do that and where you can find out more about me and past episodes of Beautiful Gray Sponge. I look forward to the next magnificent mind we'll get to learn more about. And I hope you do too. Thank you for listening. <laughs>